In my humble opinion, Fire Emblem Three Houses, the tactical role-playing game for the Nintendo Switch, is amongst the platform's strongest exclusives. In recent years, the franchise has truly gone from strength to strength, with the series offering some of the strongest library entries on the Nintendo 3DS 2. These games are as addictive as hell, with a fanbase that is growing and growing in the West. But what few people will realise is that amongst all of this greatness was supposed to be an entry for the Nintendo 64. I am Lady Decade and this is the story of the Nintendo 64's Lost Fire Emblem game. When it comes to the world of Nintendo IPs, Fire Emblem has a rather unique history. While the Japanese have been enjoying these games since the days of the Famicom, most of the world would not become familiarised with the franchise until the days of the Nintendo GameCube and Game Boy Advance. Previously, the strategy-based, text-heavy, tactical role-playing elements that this game contains was solely marketed towards the Japanese. Japanese. After all, the nation had a great track record for embracing RPGs of all sorts anyway. The winds of change would begin to blow early in the new millennium, when Western gamers would get to play as the likes of both Marth and Roy within Super Smash Bros Melee. Awesome swords swinging fighters who could even give the likes of The Legend of Zelda's Link a run for his money. Western gamers were keen to learn more about these two characters and where they had come from. Pairing their newfound popularity as well as the recent international success of the turn-based Advance Wars games, this eventually convinced Nintendo to release future Fire Emblem games in Western territories, starting with the seventh game, The Blazing Blade, under the simple title of Fire Emblem in 2003, with games continuing to see release right until this very day. This series is truly awesome. As for the series and its Japan-centric past, the game saw release on the Famicom way back in 1990 and was co-developed by Intelligent Systems and Nintendo's Research and Development One division. Being first conceived as early as 1987, the title was inspired by the developer's previous game, Famicom Wars, the 8-bit precursor to Advance Wars. Unlike Famicom Wars, Fire Emblem placed a great emphasis on storytelling, characters and traditional Japanese role-playing games in general. Designed by Shuzu Kaga and produced by Gunpei Yokoi, a legend we seem to mention every single video on this channel recently, the game would prove itself popular enough in Japan to spawn many sequels. A Famicom follow-up known as Fire Emblem Gaiden would see release in 1992, and the franchise would make the jump to the realm of 16-bit with the release of Fire Emblem Mystery of the Emblem in 1994. 1996 would bring more life to the franchise with Fire Emblem Genealogy of the Holy War and 1999 would even see a Super Famicom Fire Emblem release known as Thracia 776 through the Nintendo Power Flash Cartridge service, another topic we have also covered in the past on this channel. Keeping the regularity in which these games were seeing release, it will come as no surprise then that business was intended to continue as normal in the era of the more powerful Nintendo 64. So what would change then? Let's explore. Back in 1997, in an interview conducted by IGN, Shigeru Miyamoto would answer questions about upcoming games that were currently in development for that generation of hardware, with him mentioning the existence of a Fire Emblem 64 that the company had in the works. This would not be the last the public would hear about this game either, with multiple Japanese gaming magazines shedding more light on this title in 1998, confirming that the game would be known as Fire Emblem Maiden of Darkness. Sadly, only one known screenshot exists of this mysterious game, which displays 2D sprite work and illustrations of what appears to be polygonal, possibly pre-rendered backgrounds. 
It doesn't look like attempts were being made with the franchise for it to reinvent itself in the same way that most other franchises would for that generation. For example, Mario, The Legend of Zelda and Final Fantasy. It looks like Fire Emblem was intending to mostly stick to its roots, although there is obviously not enough available media out there to fully substantiate these thoughts. With regards to this game's cancellation, the easiest conclusion to jump to would be to acknowledge that the game was planned to see release on the Nintendo 64 disk drive peripheral, but bearing in mind what a failure that hardware was, the majority of games planned for it were cancelled. But in many cases, most of these titles were instead released as regular Nintendo 64 cartridge games, so I do not feel the death of the disk drive was quite enough to kill this title. So, what happened? Looking into behind the scenes goings on through this time period, the man who is often considered the creator of the series, Shuzu Kaga, would finally leave Intelligent Systems in 1999, where instead he would go on to found his own independent studio known as Tier Nanog, developing the Tier Ring Saga series. What is most interesting is that there was a transitional period where Kaga would work for both companies simultaneously, including while working on the Nintendo Power System game Fire Emblem Thracia 776, which we mentioned earlier. Controversially, a series of legal proceedings would end up taking place, with intelligent systems raising a dispute. They would accuse Kaga of stealing development material from the company relating to Fire Emblem when handing in his resignation. Some believe Thracia was never intended to be an intelligent systems game, but instead a title that Kaga intended to develop for his own company. To really emphasise the bad blood between Nintendo, Intelligent Systems and Kaga, the creator of Fire Emblem would not even get a mention in the series' official 25th anniversary making of Fire Emblem book. They really did try to give this man the full-on Chris Benoit treatment. This legal battle that was unfolding lines up perfectly with the development cycle of Fire Emblem 64, with the game seeing an official cancellation in the year 2000. So it is obvious that these events unfolding seemed to throw the Fire Emblem franchise into complete disarray. So the game was cancelled, end of video, or is it? As is always with these interesting stories, there is so much more to tell. The Fire Emblem creator Shuzu Kaka would be interviewed by Famitz magazine in January 2000, where Kaka would defiantly lay out his plans to create a game that takes place in his Fire Emblem universe, with his new series sharing the same story. It is of note though that through legal proceedings, Nintendo and Intelligent Systems would force Kaga to change his plans, leading to the game being renamed Tear Ring Saga, and many of the planned key story elements having to be distanced from the Fire Emblem property. Amusingly, the war did not quite end there though, as when the game saw release in May of 2001, Kaga along with the game's publishers would be sued for copyright infringement competition. Nintendo and Intelligent Systems would note that there were too many parallels in the game between Tearing Saga and Thracia 776, including characters, presentation and gameplay. Fortunately for Kaga, Nintendo would lose the copyright infringement lawsuit, but would later win a settlement against Kaga on the grounds of unfair competition. Hmm, Nintendo complaining about unfair competition? Pot kettle black, anyone? As for the axed Nintendo 64 Fire Emblem game, the staff working on the project would be reshuffled to create a new version of the game, but this time for the Game Boy Advance, a similar scenario to what would occur with Mother 64 becoming Mother 3, another tale we have covered on this channel before. 
Planning for the game would be reworked entirely from the very beginning with the original setting and plot of the game being scrapped, with only characters Roy and Carol being carried over to the GBA entry. On the 26th of July 2001, it would be confirmed that this game would be titled Fire Emblem The Binding Blade, which would later go on to be the first ever Fire Emblem game released in the West. Well, this may sound like it was the end of the story with regards to information on the Lost 64 game, enthusiasts would finally get to learn more about the project with the release of the 25th anniversary book that saw release in 2015. The anniversary book not only contains information on the game, but even shows off some concept artwork and even unreleased in-game dialogue. Here it is confirmed that the game was a very early version of The Binding Blade that was rewritten from the ground up. Roy, who would show up in The Binding Blade, was originally intended to be in the 64 game under a different name, Ike. A name that would be reused for the star character who appears in the Fire Emblem GameCube game and later past that point Super Smash Bros Brawl and even the Wii Fire Emblem entry. It's interesting to think now that if the legendary Shizu Kaga had stayed with Intelligent Systems, we would now have likely gotten the Nintendo 64 game and past that point a drastically different Fire Emblem timeline going forward. I have to say the story behind the likely cancellation of this game was far juicier and more interesting than I had anticipated, but let's be honest it is not surprising at all by this point to hear an anecdote involving Nintendo opting to sue someone. While Kaga lost on the grounds of unfair competition, what is of note though is that his victory on the grounds of copyright infringement did set a precedent in Japan for numerous Japanese developers to make extremely similar spiritual successes without the consent of the original game's contractors going forward. So. Who's to say quality games such as Castlevania's spiritual successes, such as Bloodstained Ritual of the Night and Curse of the Moon would have still existed without his important copyright victory? So I am Lady Decade and that was the story of the Nintendo 64's Lost Fire Emblem game. So if you enjoyed this video I have a playlist dedicated to cancelled and unreleased games. If you're not subscribed already then please hit the subscribe button and ring that notification bell so that you are notified every time I upload a video. I have this rather delightful, extremely unrealistic target that I would like to have 100,000 subscribers by the 4th of January which I'm never going to manage, but still, it's a laugh, we'll try it. Um, so, basically, at the end of my videos, I like to answer questions from my patrons, and this week's, this week's question is from Rob Lognick, who asks how I came up with the name Lady Decade. So, to try and answer this as, as quickly as possible without rambling, um, basically, the original idea was that I was going to have um, videos which were going to be set in different decades, so 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s onwards, and then I wanted to have basically four sets and four aesthetics for, well, corresponding to each of those um, decades. So 70s I would cosplay as like ABBA or something else, very 70s, um, 80s I'd dress up like Madonna or any other kind of 80s star, same for 90s, same for 2000s. Um, and then basically I, what I wanted to do was have all of our 70s consoles and games in the background of the 70s one. I'm sure this is basically self-explanatory but it needed me to have four staged areas which are permanently set up and I just simply do not have the room in this house to be able to do it. So I do intend in the future if I manage to have the correct amount of space if we manage to move house and get a house with 
more space or a better layout basically then I'll be able to do this but for the time being it's just not quite practical so that's all I've really got to say on it um, but if you have a question that you would like to ask me that you would like answered at the end of one of the, my one of my videos then please consider signing up to my patreon I regularly um, ask my patrons for questions and then when I run out of questions I ask for some more and um, it's it's been going quite well it's interesting and I like that I'm able to connect with you more so that you learn a bit more about me so that I'm not just this person that you know nothing about telling you all the facts and just being a retro gaming queen I want to be your retro gaming queen that you know a bit more about <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't even make sense. But anyway, I shall see you all in the next video. Thank you very much for staying until this point. And um, yes, see you next time.